Welcome to Now We're Getting Somewhere. I'm Katie, and I'm a certified life coach, but I've also been a management consultant at McKinsey and a product manager at a tech startup. In other words, I know what it feels like to have a life that looks pretty good on paper, but doesn't feel as good as I want it to. I help my professional clients develop lives that are more meaningful, happy, and also more successful. And I want to share the same practical insights with you. Let's go. Hey, everybody. Happy very end of December. I'm recording this right before Christmas because I realized that this next hour is like the only hour that I can guarantee that I don't have kids between now and about a week from now when this podcast is supposed to come out. If I don't want to record like after they're asleep, I don't know if I don't like recording at night. I don't like working at night. So we're getting it in, even though there's like a gardener across the street who might be making really loud noise. So if you can hear a blower, I apologize. But I think I'm always, I always try to be really thoughtful about the content that I put out at this time of year, at this sort of like plus or minus New Year's time of year, because I kind of feel like it is quote unquote supposed to be like the time for people in a sort of self-development industry. But on a personal level, I feel like I actually like being really intentional about my life and thinking about what I want and what changes I might want to make or whatever. But This time of year is the time of year that I least want to do that. (laughs) Like this time of year, all I want to do is chill out and rest and recharge a bit. Um, So if you want to do that too, I just want to give you a ton of permission to do that. But I had in general really been wanting to talk about intentional technology. And I thought that this would be a pretty interesting time to do that. And because the ideas that I want to share, especially today, are honestly pretty small and really easy, uh, but they also give you, in my opinion, a pretty big bang for your buck. So I will offer them in particular now because if you are wanting to have this feeling of having done something for the new year without, you know, actually doing a lot for the new year, I think what I'm going to share today could be some really interesting places to start. But before we get to my ideas for you, I just wanted to share a little bit about my own intentional technology journey. Being very intentional about my technology is something that I have been interested in for at least seven or eight years now. It's funny, this is probably less and less true for the the younger crowd listening to this podcast, but I can remember a time when my relationship to technology and screens was really just most as tools. Like, they were tools to me. There was this before time in terms of my technology usage. Like in high school, I had this really old computer in my room. It wasn't connected to the internet. The only thing that it could do was word processing. (laughs) And maybe it had like a solitaire game or maybe Minesweeper. Do you guys remember Minesweeper? But I don't even remember playing those games that much. It was really just for like typing up papers or study guides or history tests. And I didn't even have a cell phone until I could drive. And even that cell phone, I mean, I'm pretty sure like the only person's number and it was like my parents. I was just like using it to call my parents and tell them when I'd be home. I didn't even really text till college. And then even then I had like a, just a regular cell phone. So texting was kind of a pain, you know, just, you know, the numbers one through nine, you had to use like T9 words. So there was definitely a time where I barely used technology at all. And then there was kind of this after time, like, especially once I did get to college, I had this brand new laptop, there was Wi-Fi everywhere on the campus. And this was the era of the emergence of Facebook. And I found that I would be really frequently checking Facebook or doing things on the internet in the middle of studying for studying for classes or writing papers. I was checking Facebook like a lot, especially. And then, of course, by the time I was in my mid-20s in New York, I had an iPhone. And I noticed that I was spending a lot of time on that phone. I was on social media. By then, there was Instagram, but still also Facebook. I had some games on my phone. And at first in that process, I was kind of like, you know, there's no problem with this. This is just fun. This is how I unwind. But then over time, I started to feel like it was sucking up a lot of my time And I started to feel like it was affecting my mood and energy. You know, I'm a highly sensitive person. I don't have oodles of energy. So protecting it is something that is always on my mind. And also, I am somebody who runs anxious. Like, (laughs) I can tend towards anxiety. So making sure that I'm really taking care of my mental health, that really matters to me too. 
So on a personal level, that's always been the lens through which I view intentional technology. It's about time and mood and energy. I have no inherent objections to technology. I don't think it's evil. But if it takes away all my time, if it makes me anxious, if it messes with my energy, then that's something I want to be really thoughtful about. And for me, I am willing to make some things in my life slightly more difficult if it has an upside in improved mood or energy or time. I'm not going to like delete my maps app or (laughs) go back to paper maps. That's too difficult. I live in LA. I got to drive places. But as you'll hear today, and I'll probably talk about in future episodes on this topic because I hope to do a series of them, you know, being intentional about my technology has been very helpful for my mood and my energy and my time. So I thought that I would start today with the very two first things I did to get intentional about technology. I've been doing them both for six, over six years, one of them for probably like seven or eight years. So they're not like fads for me. They're just a part of my life. They're my BAU lifestyle. And especially at this time of year, I think we're all looking for ways to manage our energy a bit better. And if you're anything like me, maybe also your mood a bit better. So I hope that they will help you as much as they have helped me. So as I said, I wanted to share two things that I do. The first thing is I don't have an email app on my phone. I took off my email apps from my phone uh, probably about seven or eight years ago. It was one of the first things that I did to get intentional about technology. This was like right after or, you know, sometime maybe a year or so after I had left McKinsey. I did have a job as a product manager at a tech startup. But in fairness, it wasn't like this kind of place where we were expected to respond to emails in our off hours. And I realized that I did have my email on my phone and I was checking my email on my phone a lot. I was just checking my personal email all the time. I'd check it first thing when I got up. I'd check it when I stood in line at the grocery store. I'd check it basically whenever I opened my phone to check anything else because, you know, it'd have that little red dot with a a one in it or a two in it. And it was this thing that like maybe had a little surprise for me. It might, someone might just send a message for me with good news. I mean, isn't that like on some level, the summary of what can be problematic about so much of our screen usage, especially when it comes to things like texts and email and social media. And honestly, as I thought about it, it became clear to me that I didn't really need to check my personal or professional email more than really a few times a day. And I was able to do that when I was sitting down at my laptop. So I took my email off my phone. And honestly, in the seven to eight years since, it's mostly been great. And it has felt like it has caused me, and again, this is just my experience, but it has felt like it has caused me very few downsides and a lot of upsides. In general, I have felt less distracted. I have felt happier. I think my brain wanted to believe that my email was like constantly filled with good news constantly filled all these treats for me. But I think the truth was that it was also filled with to-dos and things I need to follow up on and things I need to think through. And even if that's not bad, it could be a little tiring. Like Even if it wasn't bad news, it could subtly mentally tire me. And it turned out that it was good for me to not constantly be putting my brain through that. I will name high level that I think this practice can sound a little scary to people because they might think, oh my gosh, what if I urgently need something in my email and I'm out of the house? So for me, how I work through that is that the truth is I can actually still check my email on my phone. I just get my email in the browser on my phone. I, I get my email through Gmail. So it's I can go to gmail.com in my browser and log in and check an email if I have to. I don't do that very often. I would say that I need to reference an email on my phone less than once every other month. It's it's genuinely pretty rare, but it does happen and I can get it if I need it. It's just slightly more of a pain to do that. But for me, that is a good thing. I don't enjoy checking email <laughs> in that way, you know, going into Safari and logging in. So I basically never do it unless I pretty urgently need an email. And this is basically less than once a month, like I said. But for me, that's an example of what I referenced before, that I'm willing to have things feel like a little bit more difficult occasionally if it gives me a mood benefit or an energy benefit, which for me it has. 
I will also say, I think another common objection to our practice like this is, but I need information in my emails while I'm out in the world. And the truth is that I do too. Like sometimes I need information that's in my emails while I'm out in the world. Like if I'm returning something I bought online, I need to drop it off at UPS, I might have been emailed a QR code that I'll need to like hand to the person at the UPS store to scan. Or there'll be some details in an email that I need to reference, I don't know, while I'm out in the world. The way that I personally handle that is that I just use my notes app. So if I knew that I needed a QR code later, then while I was checking my email on my computer, I just take a quick screenshot of that QR code and I stick it in my notes app. And my notes app automatically syncs with the notes app on my computer, on my phone rather. Or I would like copy and paste the details that I need, you know, from the email into my notes app. And I could see potentially if you were listening to this, that feeling like, oh my gosh, that's so many steps. It's so hard or difficult. But honestly, like I said, I've been doing this for like seven or eight years. I I think that I spend less than 15 seconds a day doing this. <laughs> like it's it's very low lift for me. I'm not usually copy pasting more than one thing every other day. So for me, that trade-off is worth it because I check my email so much less when it's not on my phone. And now when I even think about having my email on my phone, my body just feels tight. It just sounds stressful. So that's the first intentional technology practice that I have come to really love and that I will offer you to, con- to consider taking your email app off your phone. And the second technology, intentional technology practice that I did around that time, but a little later, maybe six or seven years ago, was that I took all toys off my phone. <laughs> I was going to call this one, I took all fun things off my phone, but actually I do still have some fun things. I have music, I have podcasts, which to me are fun. But for me, if I'm playing Candy Crush or I'm scrolling Instagram, that's like when one of my sons, my toddlers, has a toy with lights and buttons on it that fascinates them. You know, Candy Crush on my phone, that's a toy. Instagram on my phone, that's a toy. If I'm listening to a podcast on my walk, if I'm listening to some music uh, while I'm doing the dishes, that doesn't feel like a toy. It feels like a music player because typically my eyes are elsewhere. I'm not even looking at it. So for me personally, again, not everyone, but for me personally, those feel distinct in a way that makes sense for me. And look, again, I have absolutely used my phone as a toy. (laughs) I did a lot of crushing of candies for a season in my mid-20s on my iPhone. And I have definitely scrolled a lot of Instagram on my phone. Actually, one of the biggest motivations for me to make this change was that I realized that I was scrolling Instagram in bed. It was like the last thing I did before bed and then I'd have it next to my bed. And so then it was also the first thing I did in the morning. And my husband at that time really liked to read the news in bed. And it felt like, oh, yeah, we're just cozy in bed. We're on our phones, you know, at night and in the morning scrolling our phones. Eventually, I was like, you know, I don't like that I do this. This is too much. I, I'm i staying up later. I'm feeling sort of like comparison-y on Instagram right before bed and in the morning. I'm I'm wasting time. I'm not getting up because I'm on a game in the morning. This isn't what I want to be doing. So I took off all the toys. I took off games. I took off social media. Like I said, I still have a lot of things on my phone. I have podcasts and music. I do have apps. I mean, you know, I would hate to not have my directions app. I would hate to not have my photos app. There are several apps that I need for my kids. Like, you know, one of my son's preschool uses an app to check him in and out every day. And then my other son's preschool teacher uses an app to share photos from their day. And I really love receiving those photos. So I want all of those. And I like my reasons for those apps, but I don't use apps that I would consider to be toys. And I do, I will also say, still have an Instagram account. I can go on Instagram on my computer, though I try to do it less and less as time goes on. And I do even still have a Facebook account, though I'm pretty rarely on there. I basically just participate in a couple of Facebook groups, you know, one for twin moms. The twin moms are on Facebook, by the way, and another one for like some professional groups of coaches and not on there a ton, but it is helpful to have access to those communities. But what I noticed almost immediately was when I took the toys off my phone. When I took the social media and the games off, I did a lot less of those things. And look, it's not nothing. Like I am definitely capable of spending some time on YouTube on my computer. 
<laughs> I'm definitely capable of watching these like young blonde Mormon vloggers, especially when I am stressed or tired. But it, it was very significantly less for me. And I also had more time because I wasn't scrolling first thing when I got up or last thing before bed. And above all, this is a practice that to me, and again, I've done this for you know six or seven years now, it's felt like it has almost no downside as far as I can tell. Like I lost almost nothing because there are other ways to amuse myself and I got a lot of time back and I felt a lot less distracted. So I think that's also why I share it. Just to me, this has been basically like only a win. And I will also say again, my sense is that some people would hesitate to do something like this because we're afraid we'll get bored if we're, you know, say waiting in the line at the grocery store or waiting in the doctor's office or waiting to pick up our kid from school in, in line. So I also just wanted to share a little bit about how I have managed those moments just as another real person because I feel like there's not enough dialogue about, you know, basically like what to do if we're not on our phones in those kind of interstitial moments. So the first thing is, if I know there's a decent chance that I will have a, a significant weight, like I'm going to the doctor's office, I will usually throw a book or a magazine in my purse just so I have something to read. And as a general practice, if I'm running a lot of errands or I know that I'll be out of the house for a while, I will generally have a book or a magazine or my journal in my bag because, you know, even then I might stop for lunch or coffee and have a weight. And so I might just want to have something that I can do. Either it's reading or some sort of writing and reflection. If I have a pretty short wait, like I'm just standing in line at the grocery store while I'm I'm doing a quick errand, you know, I, my default is usually to do nothing. Like I kind of just look around and I zone out. (laughs) Sometimes I smile at the person next to me. And I don't mean to be like smug about that, Because I feel like, I don't know, sometimes people are like, yeah, we need to get comfortable doing nothing. But also, I think if you're used to being on your phone all the time when you're waiting in line, like it feels really weird to do that. I have been doing it so long that it's like a little bit hard to remember. But I do think it did feel a little strange at first. Like I was used to being on my phone. But now I actually find it pretty relaxing to just like kind of zone out for a little bit. Even though, yes, it's also more boring. It's just boring and relaxing. So I just say that to say, even if it feels weird at first, you might try it because you might find that it is simultaneously boring and relaxing and you like it. And I also say that sometimes if I have a wait, I will do something on my phone. You know, sometimes there's something that I've been needing to buy on my Amazon app, like, you know, we need some more diaper cream. So I'll just like take a second to do that. You know, I have an Amazon app. I'm mom. (laughs) Amazon app is super useful. I don't spend a ton of time on it, but I'll order quick things. Or much more often, it's responding to texts. I, my friends would be the first to tell you, I'm not the world's fastest text responder. So I'll often have like a few text threads that I haven't yet responded to because I try not to have my phone next to me throughout the day. So that's another practice I can talk about another time. So there'll usually be like some non-urgent conversations that I want to respond to. So if like it turns out that I got to my son's preschool a little bit early and I have a little bit of extra time and there's no one around to chat with, yes, I will respond to some texts or do a couple of things on my phone. So I just share all of that to say, you know, you can be a person who does want your phone and still doesn't have toys on your phone because that is sort of what I have become while also giving you some ideas about what you can do if you want to not be on your phone when you're in the world, if you don't want to be using Instagram or games to kind of soak up all those minutes in between things. That it can be done. It can feel pretty seamless and easy. Again, I don't really think I'm going to go back to having toys on my phone again. It just feels feels like it's something that sucks up so much energy and distracts me so much. And as someone who has been doing this for a long time now, it feels pretty doable to do that. So anyway, that is my second idea for you, that you could consider taking the toys off of your phone. So that is my two ideas for what I wanted to start this intentional technology series with. Two simple ideas I've been doing for a long time now. 
I feel like I want to really name that some of us have maybe even heard these ideas before, you know, delete games from your phone, delete Instagram from your phone. But my hope is that this also gives you some real person context about what it has meant for me in my day-to-day life, how I've made it work, the results that I have. And I also just want to say, on one hand, these are really small things. Like you could go in and delete these apps right now. You could do that in 30 seconds. But on the other hand, you know, really adapting your life, making sure that, you know, you do have a system so that you are able to have the information you need from your email when you're out in the world. Making sure that you do throw a book in your bag when you go to the doctor's office. That does take a bit of emotional energy. It takes a little bit of time to work out. So I hope you'll give yourself grace and acknowledge that might be a pretty significant undertaking to do something like that. But also, I hope that you will consider it. These ideas definitely gave me more energy. They definitely improved my mood more. They gave me time back. And I really am proud to share them first because I think I have done them so long that I can confidently say they are doable. It's possible that you may have only mostly upsides and not a ton of downsides. So that's a wrap. Like I said, I hope to make this a series about intentional technology and share some more ideas as we go. And I'm wishing you a lovely, lovely winter holiday season or just a lovely day, a lovely week. Whenever you are listening to this, I'm rooting for you. If you really want to change in a meaningful, lasting way, that's when you need a life coach. Every client I've worked with has had incredibly personalized reasons why they're in the tired or anxious or stuck or uninspired state they're in. Working with me can help you identify those roadblocks, which are usually blind spots that you genuinely cannot see, and implement a profoundly customized, doable plan for overcoming them. I have a very small, high-end, one-on-one coaching practice. If you'd like to be my next client, reach out at katiesever.com. I'd love to meet you.